all you here this morning, and I bring greetings from Crown Hill. It, it's really nice. Crown Hill starts at 9.30, uh, and then we have Sunday school afterwards, and so I didn't have to get here until 10.15 this morning, so this is a very relaxing Sunday morning, so I, I appreciate that. Um, I'm sure Jacob probably had to be earlier where, where he was. I think he's at Chestnut Ridge. I can't remember what time they start, but it's, it's good to be here with you this morning. And I'd just like to say I, I really appreciate... Uh, Jacob, uh, got to know him a little bit better over the number of years that we've been pastoring here in the same county. And really this last year, he's put a lot of thought and effort into uh, the, the missional emphasis that Ohio Conference has been working on. And he's, he's really been a lot of the, the driving intellectual force behind that. And I'm sure you all know that, but I think once you get to know someone, you kind of, you, you know them so well that you kind of overlook the gifts that they have. And Jacob is an incredibly gifted uh, of being able to really distill some pretty complex thoughts of, you know, what, is, what does it mean to be missional and all those different things and distill them into to things that us less, you know, intellectual folks can really grasp, grasp a hold of. And so I really appreciate uh, Jacob for that. And so he is a gift to Ohio Conference like I'm sure he's a gift to you guys here at Worcester Mennonite. So thank you for, for sharing him in the different capacities that he is. And I'm sure um, Chestnut Ridge is grateful to have him shared over there this morning. So this, this morning, we, for the message that we're going to look into, uh, we're really just going to dip our toes into a little bit uh, of Catholic thought and spirituality. And, and I should just say right from the get-go, uh, I'm dipping my toes into this as much as anyone else here is. And so if, if some of you come from a Catholic background or know more about Catholic spirituality, you're probably going to, you're not going to hear anything new here. Uh, but really, this, this came from me as um, I like to listen to a lot of podcasts uh, and, and one of the podcasts I was listening to was interviewing uh, the second most famous Jesuit in the United States right now. Uh, this is Father James Martin, and I was listening to a podcast, and it's just as I was listening to what uh, Father James Martin was saying and some of the words he was using, it really, it really piqued my interest, and it's like, this is, this is, in one sense, not new, but in another sense, this is very new. I'd never heard these words used this way. I've never heard this kind of understanding. And so for, for me, uh, you know, I went to Central Christian High School, uh, which is a Mennonite school. I went to Bluffton University, which is another Mennonite school. And then I've pastored in Mennonite churches uh, for my career ever since graduating from college. And so I've, I've lived in the Mennonite silos. And, and so as I listened to that podcast, it's like it was refreshing uh, to hear a, a, just a little different perspective on some, some similar concepts. And so I just want to share some of that this morning with you, just knowing that I'm by, by all means not an expert in Catholic thought and spirituality, but I still think there's a lot to be, to, that we can enrich in our faith with this. So I mentioned there, uh, I got a lot of this from um, the second most famous Jesuit in the United States right now. Does anyone, now if you want to be smarter than Crown Hill, you know the answer to this, because I asked them this and they didn't know. So who is the most famous Jesuit? Right now, yes, you got it. The Pope. So Pope Francis is a Jesuit. So again, uh, within Catholicism, there is different streams of spirituality, and one of the streams is, is Jesuit spirituality. There is also Benedictine. There is Franciscan, uh, but Jesuit was founded by Ignatius, and and so there are many different uh, orders that are that are following an Ignatius thought, an Ignatian thought. Uh, and so Pope Francis is, is right now uh, the, in the, you know, the, the seat of St. Peter in Rome, and he is a Jesuit pope, which is, uh, and it, you can tell if you pay attention to all, you know, he's, he's doing things differently than a lot of popes have before, and a lot of people attribute that to his, his Ignatian um, background and spirituality. And so with, with all that, I, I do need to give just a little bit of an apology. Like, we're, look, we're looking at this, um, but I can just imagine, so like, imagine there's a, an Ignatian Jesuit father somewhere out there who listened to a podcast about Mennonite spirituality. He's like, oh, that's exciting. I'm going to give a, a homily about that. You know, if, if, if I was sitting in the audience that morning, I would say, wow, that guy just doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, and so I, I enter into this fully knowing that I don't really know what I'm talking about. Uh, but hopefully we can, again, uh, draw some, some wisdom out of this tradition that we can, that we can be enhanced and enriched by. So really what it boils down to is there's two different words that I want to look at that I've heard of, I've spoke of, I've, I've understood before, but really um, just understood in a new way. So two different words, and the first word we want to look at is desires. Now, i got my in control here. Yes, yeah, desires. Now, this quote is from the, from the podcast here, and it's just that's really what piqued my interest, is this thought is desire is a primary way 
that God leads people to discover who they are and what they are meant to do. Just sit with that for a second. Desire is a primary way that God leads people to discover who they are and what they are meant to do. But if you want to think about, you know, what is it that God is calling me to do? Who is it that God is calling me to be? You know, we, we do a lot of discerning. We think about that, and I know especially people that are going through transitions, if they're, you know, senior in high school, senior in college, or, you know, in midlife, you're not comfortable with your position at work or whatever. We start to think of this discernment process of what is it that God wants me to do? Who does God want me to be? Where does God want me to go? And rarely, if ever, have I thought that my desires, my, my deepest longings of my heart are, are that is, that's God speaking to me. God has planted those desires within me as, a, as a, his voice leading me to something and to, to someone or to some place as this is who God wants me to be. And so this, this, this Ignatian understanding of desire that is through our desires that God speaks to us was a new concept to me. And it was, it was very refreshing to think about, you know, God is giving you these desires. It's not something to be shunned or be run away from or to be stamped down and not thought about but it is something to be discerned and explored and seen as God's call in our lives. And that part of this is is naming our desires. Uh, We want to be able to express them. And another way of thinking about this, you know, if we have these deep heartfelt desires in our lives and we don't have the ability or we don't don't, feel comfortable articulating them, that can be even a block in our relationship with God. If you, if you think about it uh, along the lines of, you know, whether it's a spouse or a very close friend or a parent or a companion or whatever the case may be, there's someone that is very, very close to you. And if you have something that's very, very close to your heart and you never articulate that to the person, that, that's going to be a block in the relationship. You know, one of the, the keys to any relationship um, is, is good communication. And if you don't communicate the deepest part of your life to, to whoever that may be, you know, there's always going to be a little bit of a distance in that relationship. And likewise, it is with with our, our relationship with God, is that we want to, to learn to have that articulation of, of discerning that, that um, desire with God, of speaking with God about our deepest desires, and understand that, that he has planted those in us, that he's planted those in us as, as a good thing that he wants us to be pursuing. So that idea of, of discerning desires, they must be, desires must be discerned. Um, and I think this is, this is something that, that um, maybe there's a reason that we, uh, maybe in the Mennonite tradition, haven't spent as much time looking at our desires and discerning them, uh, is because we also understand that this can be a double-edged knife, right? That when we look at desires, we know that um, when Scripture speaks to desires, it doesn't always speak of it in a positive light. Uh, there's, 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 uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul talks about sinful desires and selfish and desires and selfish ambition. And, and so we, we get those things and we think, okay, well, if we're supposed to follow the deepest desires of our heart, do we just do that, you know, whole, I mean, just, just jump off the, the deep end and say, well, this is, God planted this desire in me. I'm just going to go after it. And it's good. It's from God. And it's going to be whatever it is, is good. So we, we need to have some discernment in this process. There's a quote here from, again, from Father Martin. He says, our selfish desires must be discerned. He says, I quote, I want a new car because my friend has one. I want a bigger TV because my brother-in-law has one. I want a more expensive suit so that people will think I'm cool. These are, all, these are different than our deep, heartfelt longings which God lead us to. So there needs to be a desire of what is that deep, heartfelt longing that God has planted in us as a call in our life Versus what are these selfish things uh, that manifest ourselves and say, I desire X, Y, or Z. And so we need to learn how to discern between those two things. You know, what is it that God is calling me to? Some things are more obvious. Yeah, God probably isn't calling you to that bigger TV. uh, But there are some things that God is calling you to. And I I think uh, it's it's even more nuanced than just thinking these are selfish, sinful sinful desires and these are bad. And these are good, heartfelt desires and these are good. Uh, I think it's more nuanced than that, and it's really, um, they're all together in one package. And what I mean by that is really these, these selfish desires or sinful desires that the, the Apostle Paul would label them as sinful desires are, are really just a, um, a perversion of the desire that God has given us. Um, so thinking, of, thinking about, um, there's a quote, uh, G.K. Chesterton said this. I don't know if you've heard of G.K. Chesterton. Uh, But he says that every man that goes knocking on the door of a brothel is actually looking for God. 
Every man that goes knocking on the door of a brothel is actually looking for God. And what he's saying is, you know, a man that goes knocking on the door of a brothel, he's looking for something. He's probably looking for love. He's probably looking for companionship. He's probably looking for intimacy. He's looking for things in his life that he doesn't have. And, and we all know, we can say, well, going to a brothel is not a, place to, a healthy place to find fulfillment to those desires. But what K- Chesterton says in this quote is that, you know, he's, he's looking, his desires are there, his desires are right, his desires are, are from God and are healthy. He's just looking to the wrong place to get those fulfilled. Uh, there's a, a stream of thought when we're thinking about this is, you know, if we have these unhealthy desires or things that would be uh, not in the, the good side, um, this, the idea is to, to think about those, to, to interrogate those desires and say, okay, what is it within that desire um, that is manifesting itself maybe in an unhealthy way, but what is the core desire there? What is it that's beneath the surface uh, that's manifesting itself and you think, okay, well, this, this behavior may be unhealthy or this, this, this activity that this is leading me into is unhealthy. Um, so if we think of this young man knocking on the door of a brothel, the behavior is unhealthy, the activity is unhealthy, but the deeper desire there is a good and holy one. And so what, what is the way that he can follow that desire in a righteous way opposed to the way that he is doing that? Now let's take this a little bit closer to home. I, I imagine in, in most, again, I don't know you guys as well as I know Crown Hill, but in most um, Mennonite congregations that I'm aware of, there's not too many people that have a history of knocking on doors of brothels, and so it's just, you know, that's probably not the case here either. So let's, let's take it a little bit closer to home. Let's take this very same thought and, and make you guys a little bit more uncomfortable here. Uh, I'm leaving after this, and you don't pay my salary, so I can step on your toes. Um, many of you are probably parents. And if you aren't parents, you're probably grandparents. Um, and, and so let me, let, me, let me think about this in a little bit uh, with a, a parenthood or grandparenthood paradigm. All of you that are parents, um, grandparents, have that strong desire, a good and holy desire that has been planted in you from God to do the best you can for your family to provide for your family, to raise them up, whether that's your adult children or your grandchildren or your own children or whatever it is, you have that strong desire within you, and that is good and that is holy. Now, also, let me tell you that every marketer in North America knows you have that same desire. Every person that is writing up a commercial knows you have the desire that is innate within you and that is very, very strong, and they're doing their best to manipulate that desire to get as much money out of you as possible. And so every time you flip on the TV, you're going to see some type of commercial that tells you whether explicitly, some of them are very explicit, or some of them are a little bit more nuanced that you can't quite catch, but it's there, it's telling you that if you want to be a good parent, you better make this investment. You better have this insurance. You better have this car because it has X, Y, and Z safety ratings. You better have a home that's, that's big enough to accommodate that. You better have the coolest little device for your children. You better have the right cell phone policy and plan. You better have the ch- college education fund to set up. You better have all these different things, and they are playing on that desire that you have. And it's a tough one to discern because it is good. You want to prepare for your children. You want to watch out for your, your family. You want to do what's best. But if you don't have your guard up, the, our, our society and our culture will so quickly pervert that desire within you that all of a sudden you've succumbed to the sins of materialism and consumerism. And you can find yourself living in debt you find yourself unable or in, unwilling to give to your local congregation or give to, to, to charitable places or to give to God's kingdom moving forward because you've, you've, become, you've, you've, come, uh, you've succumbed to the sin of materialism and consumerism. It all started with a good and healthy desire that God planted within you, but it got perverted. Like that's a little bit closer to home for us than knocking on the doors of a brothel. And so we must be discerning about our desires. They are certainly good, and they are planted within us. And I think it's because of that we, we see the danger in some of these, and I think that's why we've become wary about saying the desires are good. We've, we've been hesitant to say that the desires are good. And especially within the Mennonite tradition, we've, we've, we've kinda, we have a, a background of, saying, of, of championing the simple lifestyle, of, of kind of the, the idea of, of self-denial, and a lot of that self-denial is very good and very biblical, but we've also thrown the baby out with the bathwater in a lot of senses and said, 
Desires are a dangerous thing. If you have that deep longing within your heart, you need to learn to deny it. You need to learn to keep it stuffed down. But not we haven't had the language and the training to affirm the goodness of those de- desires and to learn to follow those desires. Now remember, this comes from Jesuit teaching. Father James Martin is a, is a single man because he's a, he's a Catholic priest. You know, he knows what it means to, to say no to desires that he's had his whole life. One of the, in his podcast, he talks about how he fell in love when he, was, when he was in his seminary years, and he had to say no to that relationship. So it doesn't mean you know, we can just go after everything in our hearts, but it's, it's learning how to discern uh, the desires that we have in our hearts. So again, the quote is, Desire is a primary way that God leads people to discover who they are and what they are meant to do. Now, I think there's one quote and and one little story that really exemplifies this really well. And it's pretty cool. Uh, It's just a nod to the Chinese connection here. I know, Julie and John, you guys are going to China here in a couple days. Um, The the quote uh, from this comes actually from a man who spent the majority of his career and his life in China. But that's not what he's known for. Um, I'll just put the quote up here on the screen from Eric Little. When I run, I feel God's pleasure. When I run, I feel his pleasure. I think that exemplifies this really well. That he, he felt God's pleasure when he ran. And we think of, you know, a desire, a good, healthy Christian desire. You know, does running come to mind? To be able to, to run faster than anyone else in the world? You know, that's not what comes to mind. But that is what God created Eric Four, he gave him that speed and that desire to race and to compete and to run faster than anybody. And when he did that, he felt God's pleasure. And I think that just that really exemplifies it really well. Just a side note here. I like, I like uh, this, this quote because um, just wanna be, I'll, I'll tell this story because I know you have a Chinese connection here and you're, you're heading, Julie, you're heading to China. Is that Eric Little was actually um, my grandma's Sunday school teacher. Yeah, because after Eric was in the, the Olympics, he spent his career as a missionary in China. My dad's parents were career missionaries in China as well. Uh, and so is, there's a connection there that, yeah, she actually, in, in the, the, the compound they were in, uh, Eric was the trainer for my grandma when she was over there. And so, yeah, it's just it's interesting. Um, so I think that, that quote really fulfills that. So I remember, if you remember from the beginning of the sermon, I said there's two words we want to look at. Desire... And the second word is vocation. Vocation. A person feels an attraction to being a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher and so discover his or her vocation. Now, vocation and desire are very closely and intimately connected. And in this second quote up here, and this is something I learned. I had no idea about this before. Jacob's really smart. I bet he knows this already. You should ask him this when he comes back. Vocation comes from the Latin word vox, meaning voice. It implies that you are being called by God to a particular state or course of action. We can have multiple vocations. For example, one person can be married, a parent, a teacher, a music minister at church, or a visitor of the sick, etc. So for me, it's helpful to think about this because prior to, to do just dipping my toes into this Ignatian thought, I would have thought, you know, vocation, the word vocation was really just a synonym to occupation or really a synonym to career. So what's your vocation? Well, I'm, uh, I'm employed by Crown Hill Mennonite, so I'm a pastor. What's your vocation? You know, I, I, I work here. I work there. The reality is it's two very, very different things. That our vocation, the root word, V-O-X, is the call, is what God calls us to do. In an occupation, the root word is occupy, what it is that we occupy our time with. And, and so the reality is, for, for many of us, uh, the, the things that we occupy our times with and the thing that we are called to are very different. Now, there are some that get paid to do their vocation. And that, that's great. That's great when you have that alignment. But I don't think that's the case for everyone. I don't, I don't think that every vocation has a, a career in it. Uh, it's just not the case. Uh, last, last Sunday was, was Mother's Day. Um, I think you know, motherhood is one of, the, one of the highest vocations that we can have, the calling from God. Um, but yet, you know, mothers rarely, I don't know if there's any situation where a mother can get a full-time salary and benefits for, for doing that, right? But that's still, that's still a calling that, that, that in, in someone's life, a, a high vocation. And so we need to have that language, that ability to differentiate 
what it is we occupy our time with. You know, we may get paid uh, to, just to turn in the time clock and work 40 hours a week or 45 hours a week and whatever it is. And that job may not be your highest calling, and that's okay. okay I, I think uh, we, can, we can get into a trap if we're always trying to seek the next job that might be, you know, our, 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 you know whatever it is that we, uh, the perfect job for us. And at a certain point, we need to recognize, you know, I get paid to do this. But my highest calling, my vocation is this. I think the community uh, that best exemplifies this is the artist community. Right? If you know someone that is an artist, you know, the reality is most artists is very, very difficult to make, have a profession, a career in the artist field, whether it's music or whether it's, you know, drawing things with your hand or whatever form of art. It's very hard to make a living. But if you talk to an artist who's working down the street here flipping burgers, if you ask them, what are you? Are they going to say, I work at McDonald's? No, they say, they're, going to, they're an artist. That's who they are. And so I think they have that clear identity, that vocation. This is what I've called to do. I feel God's pleasure when I perform this type of art. And so for us, we think, you know, what, what, is it, what is our calling? So I'm not necessarily advocating that we all examine our career choices and our occupation choices and go into a discernment process of changing our careers. Maybe God's calling that to you. That's, that's, that's possible. But what I'm saying is, you know, can we differentiate between our occupation and our vocation and see what is it that God is calling you to do? Who is it that God is calling you to be? And that ties very closely to your deepest desires. What is that desire that God has planted in your heart, that, that, that activity, that person, that, that vocation that God is calling you to? And discern that and, and, and follow after that. And uh, not, not worry so much about tying that to your career and tying that to what you get paid for. If there is an avenue for that, that's great. I mean, I think that's great. Follow after that. But don't get hung up on that. That our vocation and our occupation are oftentimes very different. And that it is, matter of fact, I would say fairly rare that you'll find a vocation that is a career that pays you. Uh, there, it is possible, but I think it's the exception, not the rule. Now, one last thing. I want to put this up on the screen. Um, I don't know. This, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you, but I, I think I, I can get there because I know Jacob has talked to you guys probably a lot about missional thought and missional understanding. As we think about these things, about what God has called us to do, who God has called us to be, our deepest desires and our vocation, I think we know that we can't just live that out here amongst these four different walls, that God is calling us to live that out in all areas of our life. And what we've been looking at at Crown Hill is there's like there's three different circles. Um, the up, which is kind of the traditional church setting. So within church, you know, you want to live out your vocation, whatever it is, those, those gifts and desires that God has given you. You want to live that out here amongst the church community and be a blessing uh, to your church community with the vocation that you have. Uh, you also want to live that out uh, kind of in, the, in the, it's the dotted circle, the in circle, uh, where you're kind of out uh, in places that you're comfortable with, but still not necessarily your church body. So maybe that's people that you know closely, your group of friends, your group of family that doesn't go to church with you. Whatever that group of, of, that is that's, that's uh, kind of in between, you want to live out your vocation there. And then on the far right is the out. That's the place where you are a guest. Places that, that, that you don't necessarily feel at home or are welcome, but yet you, you feel that call to go into. And that's nece not necessarily going to different places or different lands far away, but where, where are places that you are a guest at, you know, that, that you don't necessarily have ownership in, that you go to and you feel that, you feel that what it's like to be a guest. And how can you live out your vocation in those places where you are, are sent to? And so as we think about our, our deepest desires, we think about our vocation, think about it in a holistic way. It's not just for here. It's not just for your, your nuclear family. It's not just for your church family. It's for the broader context that God has placed you in, that you can live out your desires and your vocation there. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you are a good God. And as Kathy read, you, you call us and we recognize your voice. And it is through your, your call that we live out our vocations. And so, Lord, I just pray for discernment for all of us as we uh, look at uh, our own desires, those, those things that you've planted in our hearts and our lives that we have a deep longing to fulfill. And we thank you for that, and we thank you that they are good and that we can affirm them and we don't have to push them aside. And, Lord, I just pray for discernment as we think about how those desires lead us into the vocation that you have called us to be. 
whether we get paid for it or not, that with the people that you've called us to be, that we can live into that vocation and be a blessing to our, our friends, our family here at the church, and the communities that we are a part of. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Thomas. So much to think about. It's really uh, sweet to have you.